everybody, Konnichiwa. Today, I'm going to show you the first chapter of Sherlock Holmes. Arthur by Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 1. Study and Sky. So let's begin. I'm going to look at the book. So, part 1. Being a ripped friend from reminiscences of John H. Watson, M.D. Wade of the Army Medical Department. <coughs> Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Chapter 1. In the year 1878, I took my degree of Doctor of Medicine of the University of London and proceeded to Netley to go through the course prescribed for the surgeons in the army. Having completed my studies there, I was duly attached to the 5th Northumberland Fuzzlers as assistant surgeon. The regiment was station I stationed in India at the time. And before I could join it, the Second Afghan War had broken out. On landing at Bombay, I learned that my corps had advanced to the passes and was already deep in the enemy's country. I followed, however, with many other officers who were in the same situation as myself and succeeded in reaching Kandahar in safety where I found my regiment and at once entered upon my new duties. The campaign brought honors and prom promotion to many, but for me, it had nothing but misfortune and disaster. I was removed from brigade and attached to Berkshire's, with whom I served at the fatal battle of Maiwan. There I was stuffed on the shoulder by desire bullet which shattered the bone and grazed the subclavian artery, which means the bone at the shoulder of a body. And where was I? So, I should have fallen into the hands of murderous Gazis. Had it not been for the devotion and courage shown by Murray, my orderly, who threw me across a pack horse and su succeeded in bringing bringing me to safety to the British lines, worn with pain and weak from the prolonged hardships which I had undergone, I was removed with a great train of wounded sufferers to the base hospital at Peshawar. Here I rallied and had already improved so far as to be able to walk about the ward and even to bask a little upon the veranda. Veranda means like the outside of a tall building. Then, when I was struck down by enteric fever, the curse of our Indian physicians, for months my life was despaired, heard of when at last I came to myself and became convalescent, I was so weak and emaciated that a medical board determined that not a day should be lost when sending me back to England. I was dispatched accordingly in the troop ship Orontis and landed a month later on Port Mouth Jetty. With my health irretrievably ruined, but, my, but with permission from a paternal government to spend the next nine months, months in attempting to improve it. I had neither kit or kin in England, and was therefore as free as air, or as free as an income of eleven shillings and sixpence a day will permit a man to be. Under such circumstances, I naturally, I naturally gravitated to London, the great cesspool into where all the loungers and idlers of the empire are irresistibly drained. There I stayed for some time at a private hotel in the Strand, leading a comfortless, meaningless existence, and spending m such money as I had considerably more freely than I out. So alarming that the state of my finances become that I soon realized that I must either leave the metropolis and rusticate somewhere in the country, or wh what, or that I must make a complete alteration in my style of living. Choosing the latter alternative, I began to make up my mind to leave the hotel 
and take my quarters in some less pretentious and less expensive domico. On the very day that I had come to this conclusion, I was standing in Criterion Bar when someone tapped me on the shoulder and turning around, I recognized young Stamford who had been a dresser under me at Bart's. The sight of a friendly face in the great wilderness of London is a pleasant thing indeed to a lonely man. In old days, Stamford had never been a particular crony of mine, but now I hailed him with enthusiasm. And he, in his turn, appeared to be delighted to see me in the exuberance of my joy. I asked him to lunch with me at the Holborn, and we started off together in a hansom. Whatever have you been doing with yourself, Watson? He asked in an disguised wonder as we rattled through the crowded London streets. You are as thin as a lath and as brown as a nut. I gave him a short sketch of my adventures and I had hardly concluded it by the time we reached our destination. Poor devil, he said clumsily after he listened to my misfortunes. What are you up to now? Looking for lodging. I answered trying to solve the problem as to whether it is possible to get comfortable rooms at a reasonable price. That's a strange thing, remarked my companion. You are the second man today that has used that expression to me. And who was that first? I asked. A fellow who was working at the chemical laboratory up at the hostel. He was bemoaning himself this morning because he could not get someone to go house with him in some nice rooms which he had found and which were too much for his purse. By Jove, I cried, if he really wanted, wants someone to share the rooms and the expense, I am the very man for him. I should prefer having a partner to being alone. Young Stamford looked rather strangely at me over his wine glass. You don't know Sherlock Holmes yet, he said. Perhaps you would not care for him as a constant companion. Why? What is there against him? Oh, I didn't say that there was anything against him. He's a little queer in his ideas. An enthusiastic in some branches of science. As far as I know, he is a decent fellow. A medical student, I suppose, said I. No, I have no idea what he intends to go in for. I believe he is well up in anatomy and he is a first-class chemist. But as far as I know, he has never taken out any systematic medical classes. His studies are very desultory and eccentric, but he has amazed a lot out of the way knowledge which would astonish his professors. Astonish his professors. Did you never ask him what he was going for? I asked. No. He is a man that is that it is easy to draw out, though he cannot be communicated enough when the fancy seizes him. I should like to meet him, I said. If I am to lodge with anyone, I should prefer of a man of studious and quiet habits. I am not strong enough yet to stand much noise or excitement. I am not enough of both of Afghanistan to last me for the remainder of my natural existence. How could I meet this friend of yours? He is sure to be at the laboratory, returned my companion. He either avoids that place for weeks or else he works there for, from morning till night. If you like, we will drive around. After lunch, yawn. Certainly, I answered, and the conversation drifted away into other channels. As we made our way to the hospital after leaving Holborn, Stamford gave me a few more particulars about the gentleman who I proposed to take a fellow lodger. You mustn't blame me if you don't get on with him, he said. I know nothing more of him than I have learned from meeting him occasionally in the laboratory. You proposed his arrangement, so you must not hold me responsible. If you don't get on, it will be easy to part company. I answered, it seems to me, Stanford, I added, 
looking hard at the hands of the matter, is the fellow, is the fellow, temper or formidable? Well, what is it? Don't be merely mouthed about it. It is not easy to express an inexpressible. He answered with a laugh. Holmes is a little too scientific for my taste. It approaches to cold bloodness. I could imagine his giving of a friend a little pinch of the latest vegetable alkaloid, not out of mal- malevolence, you understand, but simply out of a spirit of interjust inquiry in order to have an accurate idea of a fix to do him justice. I think that he would take himself with the same readiness he appears to have passion for definite and exact knowledge. Very right, too. Yes, but it might be pushed to excess when it comes to beating the subject into dissecting rooms with a stick. It is certainly taking rather a bizarre shape. Beating the subjects, yes, to very how far bruises may be produced after death. I saw him at it with my own eyes, and yet you say he is not a medical student. No, heaven knows what the objects of his studies are. But here we are, and you must form your own impressions about him. As he spoke, we turned down a narrow lane and passed through a small side, which opened into a wing of the great hospital. It was familiar ground to me, and I need a guiding as we ascended the bleak stone staircase and made our way down to the long corridor. With its vista of whitewashed wall and dun colored doors, Neither the farther end a low arch passage branched away from it and led to a chemical wrap facility. This was the lofty chamber, lined and littered with countless balls. Broad low, t- broad, low tables were scattered about, which bristled with retorts, test tubes, and little bunks in the lab. With their flickering, with their blue flickering flames. There was only one student in the room who was bending over a distant table absorbed in his work. At the sound of our steps, he glanced around and sprang to his feet with a cry of pleasure. I found it! I found it! He shouted to my companion, running towards him and us with a test tube in his hand. I I have found a reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and by nothing else. Had he discovered a gold mine, greater delight could not have shown upon his features. Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Stanford introducing us. How are you? He said cordially, gripping my hand with a strength for which I should hardly have given him credit. You have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? I asked in astonishment. Never mind, said he, chuckling to himself. The question is, is about hemoglobin. No doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine. It is interesting chemical, chemically, no doubt, answered. But practically, why, man, it is the most practical medicalology legal discovery for years. Don't you see that it gives us the infallible test for blood stains? Come, come over here now. He sees me by the coat sleeves in his eagerness, and he draws drew me over to the table at which he had been working. Let us have some fresh blood, he said, digging a long botkin into his finger and drawing up red salting drop of the red salting drop of blood and a chemical pipette. Now I added this a small quantity of blood to a liter of water. You perceive that the resulting mixture has an appearance of pure water. The proportion of blood cannot be more than one in a million. I have no doubt, however, that we shall be able to obtain the characteristic reaction. As he spoke, he threw the vessel a few white crystals and then added some drops of transparent fluid. An instant, the contents assumed a dull mahogany color and brownish dust, which precipitated to the bottom of the glass jar. Ha ha ha, he cried, clapping his hands and looked. Being as delighted as a child with a new toy. What do you think of that? It seems very delicate. It seems to be a very delicate test, I remarked. Beautiful, beautiful. 
the old Gaussian test was very clumsy and uncertain. So is the microscopic examination for blood corpuscles. The latter is valueless if the stains are a few hours old. Now this appears to act as well the, whether the blood is old or new. Had this test been invented, there were hundreds of men in now walking, walking on the earth who would have long ago, pe- pe- long ago have paid penalty for their crimes. Indeed, I murmured, criminal cases are continually hinging upon that one point. A man is suspected of a crime months before. Perhaps after it had been commuted, committed, his linen or clothes are examined and brown stains discovered upon them. Are they blood stains? Or are they mud stains? Or are they rust stains? Or are they food stains? Or what are they? That is the question which has puzzled many an expert. And why? Because there was no reliable test. Now we have the Sherlock Holmes test, and there will no longer be any difficulty. His eyes fairly, fairly glittered as he spoke. He spoke, and he put his hand over his heart and bowed as if someone applauding crowd conjured up by his imagination. You are to be congr- congratulated, I remarked, considerably surprised at his enthusiasm. There was the case of the Bon Bischoff at Frankfurt last year. He would certainly have been hung had this test been exist. Then there was Mason of Bradford and the notorious Muller, Liberal of Montpelier, and Samson of New Orleans. I could name a score of cases in which it could have been deceived. You seem to be walking a walking calendar of crime, said Stamford with a laugh. You must start a paper on those lines. Call it the police news of the past. Very interesting. Dreaming it might be made too, remarked Sherlock Holmes, sticking a small piece of plaster over his thick finger. I have been, I have to be very careful. He continued, tuning to me with a smile. For I dabble with poisonous poisons a good deal. He held out his hands as he spoke, and I noticed that I was all mottled over with similar pieces of plaster and discolored with strong acids. We came here on business, said Stamford, sitting down on a high tea legged stool and pushing another one in my direction with his foot. My friend here wants to take diggings, and as you were complaining that you could get no one to go house with you, I thought that I had better bring you together. Sherlock Holmes seemed delighted at the idea of sharing his rooms with me. I have an eye on a suit in Baker Street, he said, which would suit us down to the ground. You don't mind the smell of strong tobacco, I hope. I was smoke ships myself, I answered. That is good enough. Generally, I have chemicals that about and occasionally to do experiments. Would that annoy you? By no means. Let me see. What are my other shortcomings? I get in the dumps at times, and I don't open my mouth for days on the end. You must not think I'm sulky when I do that. Just let me alone and I'll soon be right. What have you to confess now? It's just been well for two fellows to know the worst of another one another before they begin to leave together. I laughed at this cross examination. I keep a bullpup, I said, and I object to Rose because my nerves are shaken. And I get up at all sorts of ungodly hours, and I am extremely lazy. I have another set of vices when I'm well, but those are principal ones at present. Do you include violin playing in the category of oaths? I asked anxiously. It depends on the player, I answered. A well-played violin is a treat for the gods. A badly played one? Oh, that's all right, he cried with a merry laugh. I think you may consider the thing as settled, that is, if the rooms are agreeable to me. When shall we see them? Call for me here at noon tomorrow, and we'll go together and settle everything, he answered. All right, noon exactly, said I, shaking his hand. We left him working 
among his chemicals and we walk together towards my hotel. By the way, I asked suddenly, stopping and turn, turning upon Stamford, or how the deuce did he know that I had come from Afghanistan? My companion smiled and an energetical smile. That's just his little peculiarity, he said. A good many people have wanted to know how he finds things out. Oh, what a mystery is it? I cried, I'd rubbing my hands. This is a very quick wind. I'm much agreed to you for be- bringing us together. The proper study of mankind is man. You know, you must study him then, Stamford said as he bade me goodbye. You'll find him a naughty problem, though. I'll wagger he learns more about you than you about him. Goodbye. Goodbye, I answered and strolled on to my hotel, considerably interested in my new acquaintances. So, this is chapter one finished. Thank you guys for watching. Assalamu alaikum. Sayonara.